Okay guys, so this is a NMR, Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy, set up five times fast. And this is a really, really difficult. Um, you don't actually need to know how the machine works, which is what I'm going to explain now. Um, I'm just doing this kind of, uh, in case you're interested, how it works. But you don't, you won't be tested on this in the exam, uh, if you do OCR anyway. Um, and if you are maybe in slightly lower ability, you probably won't get this. So don't worry too much if you don't. Okay, this is just... Uh, you know, for your information. So basically, NMR, multi-million pound machine, uh, one of the most expensive ones I think is $16 million, which is, you know, fairly pricey. And essentially what it does is it generates a ridiculously powerful magnetic field. If you go on YouTube and type in NMR magnetic field, you'll see just some kind of crazy things you can do, like uh, moving whole screwdrivers and things with the magnet. Really powerful. So this magnetic field will have a direction. And I'm going to represent that by just an arrow line. So this is my magnetic field and its direction. Now, if you have a nucleus, and that nucleus will have nucleons in it. And a nucleon is either a proton or a neutron, something that lives in the nucleus. Um, and like an electron, a nucleon can have a spin. So it can either spin up, which is an arrow pointing up, or it can spin down, which you represent with an arrow pointing down. Now, they what they do is they pair up. So if I had an even number of nucleons, for every spin-up nucleon I have, it would pair with a spin-down nucleon and they would cancel each other out. So there would be no overall direction to the nucleus. But if we have uh, an un uneven number, so for example carbon-13, uh, you'll have an extra nucleon left. Now this nucleon can either spin in the same direction as your magnetic field, or it can spin in the opposite direction. Obviously, you can't have both of these at once, it's one or the other. Now, to make an analogy, if we think that this magnetic field is like a stream, is it easier to swim in the same direction of the stream or against the stream? Well, obviously, it's a lot easier to swim in the same direction. That takes less energy. So, if your nucleus uh, is in the same direction as your magnetic field, it will be in a low energy orientation. But what we can do, so let's imagine that's there. What we can do is we can zap the nucleus with radio waves, and it will absorb these radio waves and flip into the opposite orientation, which is going against the magnetic field, which must therefore be higher in energy. So in order to get from here to here, we have to absorb radio waves, energy, basically. And what we can do is we can measure what this difference is and, and use that to figure out something about our molecule. However, the exact distance between this low energy state and this high energy state is determined by the environment that your nucleus is in. So, for example, we've got three different carbon environments here. The environment just means what is it surrounded by, what is it bonded to. And basically, again, this is quite complicated, but the way it works is the more electron density you have around your nucleus, the more your, your carbon nucleus is shielded from a magnetic field. And therefore, this distance is smaller. So, in something like this carbon here, where all of the electron density has been pulled away by the oxygen, because it's more electronegative, um, this won't have very much electron density. So it won't be shielded from the magnetic field by the electrons. So it'll feel a lot of force. So it'll be a lot harder for your uh, nucleus to swim against the magnetic field, to go against it, because it feels more of the magnetic field. The more powerful this is, the bigger the gap. Whereas this carbon over here, because it's not really getting much of its electron density pulled away by the oxygen, you know, hardly any at all, that means it'll have loads of electrons around it, which means it'll be shielded uh, from the magnetic field. So in order to swim with the magnetic field, it's almost the same energy as to swim against it, because it doesn't really feel much of it. Okay. Um, so, depending on the environment, will depend essentially, I guess, on the frequency of this uh, radio wave radiation, the, the gap between it, and we can use something called a Fourier transform to uh, plot that on a graph, 
And what you essentially get, now in my mind, this isn't strictly true, but in my mind, I, I always think of this scale here as frequency. Now, it's actually called chemical shift. But you can just think of it as the frequency of the radiation absorbed by your nucleus. The difference between that same direction as the magnetic field and the opposite direction. And remember, the more electron density you have around your atom, the smaller that gap will be. But the scale works in reverse, so it goes from like zero to you know, whatever down here, a higher number. Um, so, Roughly speaking, uh, this carbon here, this hasn't got hardly any electron density, so it won't be shielded at all, so it'll have a really large chemical shift. So we have absorption here. Remember, just think of this as frequency, even though really it's not. So this carbon absorbs a very specific type of radiation to flip its spin at whatever this number is on your frequency or chemical shift. This one here is going to have a little bit of its electron density pulled away, so that's going to absorb somewhere down here. And this one here, because that's got loads of electron density around it, that's shielded loads from the magnetic field, so that doesn't take much uh, energy at all to flip it, so you know, that'll be somewhere down here. And that's the very, very simplified way of how it works.